Okay, good morning and welcome everyone to uh, this, the 12th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2019. Uh, we have apologies from the convener, Joanne Lamont, so I shall convene uh, today's meeting in her absence. And we also have apologies from David Torrance. Um, we have two items on our agenda this morning, consideration of two new petitions and seven continued petitions. Uh, the first new petition before us today is PE 1720, Natural Flood Alleviation Strategy for Scotland. Uh, the petition was lodged by Les Wallace and calls for the development of a natural flood alleviation strategy under the Flood Risk Management Scotland Act 2008. The note prepared by SPICE and the clerks provides an overview of the current position in the context of the 2008 Act. It provides a definition of natural flood management as set out in SEPA's Natural Flood Management Handbook and refers to the Natural Flood Management Network uh, developed in partnership between the Scottish Government, SEPA and the James Hutton Institute. The petition refers to the role beavers might play in uh, flood risk management and this is discussed in paragraphs 10 to 14 of the paper by Spice and the Clerics. Uh, paragraphs 15 to 18 of the note outlines Scottish Government action including its climate change plan as well as the Government's support for the development of natural flood management approaches such as the Edelston Water Project and the EU Interreg Building with Nature Project. The note refers to the recent assessment by the Committee on Climate Change, which states that there remain key data and evidence gaps that make it difficult to assess progress for a number of priorities in terms of flooding and flood risk management. It, the remainder of the note outlines previous parliamentary questions and answers on this matter. So do members have any comments or suggestions for action? Me, I'd just like to make uh, a point that, uh, uh, first of all, the petition had received a, a significant number of signatories, and um, that's encouraging, and um, particularly with our aims and goals with climate change. And um, I was actually unaware of the uh, natural flood management uh, techniques that were available, um, including the hydrological and the morphological um, procedures. Um, I think it is important, and they do make a good point, that... Um, it needs to be a collaborative pro uh, approach with the traditional uh, styles of engineering that we use to um, guard against uh, flood risks and use those as defence. Um, I was also interested to note that the, the usual suspects, SEPA and the James Hutton um, Institute and the Scottish Government, have got 100 nat nat uh, natural flood management um, actions. So, I mean, what I'm trying to say, I suppose, is that I'm I think it's really great that they are looking at this and that we, we must do this to reach our climate change goals. I also note that it's important that the Committee on Climate Change has um, mentioned that flood mapping is so important and that currently there are key, uh, gaps, as you've just um, mentioned, convener. So uh, I do think that I would like to know a little bit more anyway from the... the the individuals that are involved in the, um, the 100 actions. Okay. Brian, any comment? Yeah, I, I, mean, I think, that, uh, again, I, th I think this is a, a really interesting uh, interesting petition. I think you know, the, the, the extra dynamics in there is the, the reintroduction of beavers into the into the ecosystem and, and, the, and the impact they can possibly have um, downstream from, from um, the, the dam building, one, uh, the, the dam building they do, and the impact that could potentially have on farming, because we know there's a little bit of contention around that. So I think, you know, um, I, I mean, I think in the, in the first instance, I'd be really interested to see what the Scottish government um, seek their views and what the action, what action they, they, they see um, as in called for by the petition to see how they, re they reflect on that. Okay, thanks. Um, perhaps I should declare that the petitioner is, is uh, w one of my constituents. Um, so, are we agreed that in the first instance we should write to the Scottish Government seeking its views on the action uh, called, um, specifically for its response uh, on, on the data and the evidence, and also, um, as Brian uh, Whittle has suggested, there are challenges with regard to uh, you know farms and and, and areas such as that. So in addition to uh, contacting um, key stakeholders like SEPA, SNH and the James Hutton Institute, um, would members agree that it might be an idea to contact 
the National Farmers Union Scotland and also Scottish Land and Estates for their views yeah, as well. Yeah, I, I think convener as well, perhaps um, fisheries management um, Scotland, because that's part of the conversation. And in England, there's a lot of work being done on uh, ca the catchment management approach. And the uh, country file Landwood last Sunday uh, talked about River Itchen. And it was a very interesting program. So this is the approach, I think, that we're going to be uh, guided along. Yes, indeed. OK, if, if that's agreed, then um, we'll ask the clerks to, to take that forward. And um, we'll move on to um, petition PE1721. A national Tourism Strategy for Scotland and the Role of the National Trust for Scotland. Um, this petition was lodged by John Hanks on behalf of the Friends of Gielston. It calls for the Scottish Government to meet with the National Trust for Scotland to discuss the role the Trust can play in the context of the National Tourism Strategy. It asks that the future of any Trust property under threat of closure be included as part of any discussion. The note prepared by Spice and the Clarks provides a brief summary of the roles and remits of different parties and stakeholders, including the Scottish Government, the Tourism Industry and the National Trust for Scotland. Members will note the par that the paragraph 9 of the note refers to an updated tourism strategy being developed by the Scottish Tourism Alliance. The strategy steering group set up to deliver that updated strategy does not include the Trust. This is an example of a petition being set in the national context, which stems from a, a local experience. So um, this morning we're uh, joined by Jackie Bailey and Morris Corey, who both have an interest in, in this petition. Um, and perhaps before we go to members of the committee, um, it may be helpful if, uh, if Ms Bailey and uh, Mr Corey could provide any comments to add context uh, to assist us with this consideration. So. Ms. Ms. Bailey. Convener, um, uh, and thank you to the committee for your time this morning. Um, as you already said, I'm joined by my colleague, Maurice Corey, um, and you, I hope the committee understands the truly cross-party approach and support um, given to this petition. Can I also, through you, Convener, welcome the members of the Friends of Gilston who are in the public gallery today. Um, the petition, as you rightly point out, is set in the context of our national tourism strategy, um, which, as members will know, is all about showcasing Scotland as a visitor destination with um, first choice, high quality, value for money and memorable visitor experiences. That's the vision set by the Scottish Government and one which we would all support. Tourism is, of course, growing, particularly from visitors from mainland Europe. Um, and Scotland's unique selling point is our heritage, our monuments, our castles, um, our stunning landscapes that we enjoy um, day in and day out. But we know if we we're going to sustain this, we need a range of high quality visitor experiences. And we need to get much better at linking destinations um, so we can contribute to that overall experience being maintained. Um, it might surprise you to, to know that gardens are hugely important in, that, in making that contribution to our tourism offer. Um, there is a UK Select Committee, which currently is looking at the importance of gardens and their contribution to tourism um, and the natural heritage of the UK. Um, a recent survey, which was carried out by the British Tourist Authority, said that 32% of foreign visitors spent time in parks and gardens when on holiday. I was quite surprised at how high that figure was, because it's almost as many as visited some of our famous monuments and castles and attractions at 35%. So there's not that much difference and I think goes to um, underline the significance of gardens to our tourism offer. Now, Scotland is blessed with some stunning gardens. Um, you know, we're all familiar with the botanic gardens at Kelvin Grove in Glasgow, the Royal Botanical Gardens in Edinburgh, um, that attracts hundreds of thousands of visitors. But there are many, many more. I'm not going to take up the committee's time by naming them all. Um, we would be here all day. But I do want to talk about a very local example, which is Gilston Gardens um, in my constituency. Gilston Gardens and House, they were gifted 
to the National Trust for Scotland by Ms Hendry, together with quite a substantial endowment at the time. Um, it's listed in the UK Top 100 Gardens. I can't quite remember its position, but certainly for me, and I suspect for Morris as well, it's number one. Um, out of that one list of 100. Um, but rather disappointingly and surprisingly in our view, in 2016, the National Trust for Scotland took the decision to actually close and dispose of the property um, and the gardens. And they transferred the endowment funds um, into their general funds. I have to say to the committee, I found that an incredibly short-sighted decision entirely contrary to the clear direction of travel set by the Scottish Government in their tourism strategy. Now, the Friends of Gilston Gardens are challenging that decision. They're challenging it on a number of fronts. Um, firstly, the refusal to use that financial endowment that was part of the bequest to renovate the property um, to reduce the operating deficit. Um, they're challenging it because the National Trust for Scotland's accounting practice doesn't credit any income to the property from the high percentage of visitors who are actually National, National Trust for Scotland members, um, and that results in it appearing to have an operating deficit, but we know NTS members are using the gardens all the time, and they're challenging it as well on the low rating given to the gardens on the NTS's particular measures of value. I also have to add that in the context of the local economy, it's really important. There's a linkage, a natural linkage in my view, um, for NTS members between the gardens and Hill House in Helensborough, which is also owned by the National Trust. Um, but when you look at the local businesses that have grown up as a result of the footfall generated by the gardens, it has a significance in the local economy, as well as having a significance um, for the tourism strategy overall. So there are a number of reasons they're, they're, they're challenging that. Um, as part of those discussions, they have worked with the National Trust to commission a study on future options, and I would invite the committee to maybe ask the National Trust for a copy of that study, because I think that would be instructive. Um, in, in looking at this, but you know, we, we're very clear that actually this isn't just the gardens and the house that are under threat of closure. There are other properties run by the NTS that are facing similar challenges. Um, and we do need to look at all of those in the round because collectively they add to the tourism offer um, that we have. So um, Scottish gardens do make a contribution to Scottish tourism a contribution that I don't think is sufficiently recognised in the tourism strategy, but people are waking up to this. Mm -hmm. Some NTS gardens are getting investment. Others are actually being, dare I say it, neglected and may well be on the list for closure. Um, we cannot have just a concentration of investment in flagship properties and ignore the gardens that form such a part of the natural heritage of Scotland. Um, so I would invite the committee, if I might be so bold to do so, why don't you come and visit the gardens? I would love to host the petitions committee um, in Cardras to visit the gardens, because I'm sure you would, you would enjoy it and fall in love with it, and it would become your number one garden too. Um, could I suggest the committee might want to write to the National Trust, indeed consider bringing them before this committee, um, along with the Scottish Government, but get the study from them to see what local people have tried to do to maintain and, and keep the garden and the property in the future. Um, perhaps ask the National Trust what other plans they have for properties and gardens in their portfolio um, and invite them to perhaps reflect on the petition, their importance to the tourism strategy in Scotland and to stop any closures until they've had an opportunity to discuss what they're doing with the Scottish Government and with this Committee of the Parliament. Thank you very much, Convener. OK, thanks, uh, Ms Bailey. Um, Maurice Corrie, do you have anything to add? Um, I, I endorse entirely what Jackie Bailey has just said, uh, and I agree entirely on the point that it is a cross-party matter, uh, and we work closely on this from the beginning. Uh, along with friends of Gilston. Um, it is very important that this is actually um, quite a unique uh, property, it, uh, Gilston. Uh, it has a lot of connection with the shipbuilding industry and the shipping industry of the River Clyde. It, it brings the, a lot of that together. Uh, also, it's a, it's a double whammy when people come to the area because we've got 
Hill House, which has just had a massive amount invested in it, um, and will continue to do so, obviously, um, and therefore this is right on the, fo on, on the footpath to it. Um, so I think it would be crazy for it to be any, any consideration of closure by the NTS at all. Can I also declare that I was a member of the National Trust for Scotland when this first came up before. I, I think my uh, membership was slightly delayed at the moment, but never mind. Um, but I'm certainly very supportive of it. Um, and I think the fact is that the gardens are very important. And I, as a young lad, born and brought up in the area, knew the Miss Henry and uh, Miss Bell, who, who lived there. Uh, and I know from uh, knowing them quite well, is that it would be the wish of Miss Henry not to have seen that money go into a central pot. Um, and I think that's very sad that's happened. Um, and I think that really should be reconsidered by the National Trust for Scotland headquarters, and that should be made purely for investment in the house itself and gardens. Um, I would like to pay tribute to the friends of uh, Gilston, uh, who've done a fantastic job to highlight the issues of Gilston House. Um, and it is a place, if you just got to go there and you see the people come in, it's, it's quite incredible who come along. There's actually an active working kitchen garden, which sells produce uh, to people in the area. I, for one, buy produce from it for the Sunday lunch. That's great. I recommend the parsnips. Um, but also, um, I think it's, it, it, it's as, I say, as Jackie said, it's actually, as Jackie Bailey said, it's in the top 100 UK gardens, which is pretty good. Um, and I think that's something that should be borne in mind when you're looking at this. But there is, I understand, obviously, throughout the whole of Scotland, National Trust of Scotland, and in conversations with the chairman of it, is that there's various considerations being looked at. But I am very, very concerned that there's, there's a heavy hammer, hammer approach to Gielsen on this. And I do not think they're listening to the details that are really coming forward from the reports being made by the friends of Gielston, and I know there's a tremendous effort being put into that. Um, future options, there are options on the table suggested by friends of Gielston. I do implore that they talk to them, that they do look at that. Um, I know, to be fair to the National Trust, they have asked and obviously are keen that some form of collaborative, some form of community group to come together to, to, to come forward. I, wearing my um, Armed Forces and Veterans hat, um, have looked at the possibility of the House being uh, involved with some um, housing for, for veterans, uh, and that's a possibility. So there are a lot of things there, but I, I just feel that the ham heavy hammer approach by the National Trust at the moment is actually is, is beyond the pale, really, uh, into this, and I think the committee needs to have a real look at this, an in-depth study, because there's lots of information that's been led uh, by John Hanks and other members of the Friends uh, for the options uh, for, for the House. And, and also, the other thing you notice is that when you drive into the, into the gardens, there are a lot of children there. There are young people go to it. Um, and it's the great place. They set up a, a young people's sort of um, play area, and, and Jackie Bailey will, will, will know this. Um, and that's encouraged. And they have lots of open days and various things. I think Macbeth was, was, was staged the other day in the gardens, a beautiful setting for it, in a walled garden. And anybody you talk to just wandering around, and I've done it many times, is absolutely, they come from a long way away, not just local areas. So I do commend to the committee if you would go down and visit it. We were more than happy to host you there. Uh, it's a very good cup of coffee there. Um, and you can buy some very nice parsnips and vegetables, if you like, at the same time, contribute to the, to the well-being of the gardens. So... Um, it would be a great sadness if it was closed. I think it would be extremely foolish to close it because, as I say, it is so close to Hill House that the people there can get you know, a good bang for their buck, basically, by coming to visit two places. So I recommend it is, it, is, it is very much kept going. And in particular, it's the gardens that stand out. Thank you for listening to us. OK, thank you. I'm, I'm sure they appreciate the various plugs there from... Uh, for coffee and parsnips, but um, <laughs> uh, uh, I wonder if um, I could ask, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if the, the, the figure that was transferred uh, uh, from the endowment uh, is public knowledge, but is, could you give us any indication as to how much was involved? I, I can certainly let the committee know in writing after, but, but it was quite a substantial endowment. Um, but because it wasn't attached directly to the property in the gardens, um, the National Trust were able to remove that and put it into general funds. Obviously, we're very disappointed by, by that decision. Um, but we recognise that legally, they, they, even though morally they may not, shouldn't have done it, legally they were able to do so. Mm -hmm. Can I come in there? I can probably add that the figure originally was 800,000 and it's now climbed into the millions So, because obviously through time it's, it's increased. Okay. Um, so it wasn't insubstantial, Chair. No, fairly substantial, yeah. Okay, um, 
Thanks. If, if I could turn to uh, committee members, uh, ask if they've any I, news. I don't know if I've read the wrong figure, but I'm sure it's a figure of two and a half million. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, oh, the we're, owner we're of the state, of the, uh, which is worth in the region of two and a half million legacy. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks for your plugs as well. It sounds amazing. I, I'm not sure if you're on commission for the parsnips, Morris. Um, I, I mean, I hear what you're saying. Um, it's clearly valuable to local people and to members. I've got a couple of questions, if that's okay to direct to. Um, to, to um, those people, I wondered why why it is that the friends of uh, Gilston are not keen for a community trust to run the gardens. Um, I also wonder, does the report, and it sounds as though, uh, Miss Bailey, you haven't seen the report, and that's why you're uh, encouraging us to get a copy of the report from the National Trust, because it's very difficult to know what the operating costs are. Um, and if that is what indeed is, is putting um, the friends off running the, the trust in itself. The other point I want to make is a general one, which is that I think it's an important point that the petitioner makes that, that identifying what role the National Trust plays within the national tourism strategy is very important. Um, because if they're not involved in um, as part of the Scottish Tourism Alliance, then it is very difficult to, to work that out. But clearly, um, as an independent charity, it is in their best interest to increase the number of uh, visit, uh, members, increase the number of footfall within the property, and to safeguard their properties as well. So it's about, I think there's two different things here, perhaps is involving those people in the tourism strategy and understanding what it is that is putting the friends off the community trust. Okay. Um, let me respond to, to both those points. Firstly, in terms of the study, it was carried out by ECOS. My understanding is it was commissioned by the National Trust, working alongside the community to shape the terms of the study. I certainly was interviewed for it. Um, my understanding is that study is now complete but I haven't yet been provided with a copy by the National Trust, but I would invite, obviously, the committee to, to request that of them. Hopefully, I might receive one in the post after they've, they've watched this committee meeting. Um, I think there's an issue at a strategic level. So whilst we're naturally concerned about our local garden, it could be your local garden tomorrow, and we're concerned that the National Trust for Scotland, perhaps, and maybe I'm being unfair, but focuses on the big ticket visitor attractions, and actually these smaller gardens, which are critically important to our tourism offer, um, don't get taken account of. Um, the local community adore those gardens. You, you'll have heard you know, from Morris and myself just, just how much so. Um, but it is a huge responsibility to ask a community group to take on a house that requires repairs currently into the, the, the at least one, if not two million. I suspect it's nearer two million. Um, a gardens which are quite extensive. And actually, we don't have that, at strategic level, the opportunity to make linkages with other National Trust properties. So, for example, the linkage we've described with Hill House, which is 10 minutes up the road. Okay? So it makes sense that one body is looking at all of these collectively rather than fragmenting it into disparate community groups running them. Um, we have a great bunch of enthusiastic members, but, but to be honest, that's now. What happens in 20 years' time? You know, so I think they quite properly are saying they will help in any way they can. And believe me, they are very active. Um, but actually taking responsibility when the National Trust should be doing so, they think is probably um, an error, um, given that we need to keep this at a very strategic level. Um, I go back to the figures that, that actually stunned me. I didn't realise that 32% of foreign visitors visited gardens and parks as much as, you know, 35% going to visit um, famous monuments. That's huge. We have a great garden network that we just don't exploit as part of our tourism strategy. So we need to fix that. We need to keep um, not just Gilston, but other gardens like it, because that contributes substantially um, to our tourism offer in Scotland. Could I just ask another supplementary? The two and a half million legacy, if that was put um, back into uh, the general funds, as you said, um, 
is there no kind of rule that safeguards that? And even if there isn't, why wasn't that used to actually safeguard the, the Gilston property? I invite you to put that question to the National Trust because that, that indeed are the questions we're asking because the building didn't get into the state of repair overnight. Um, so investment in the building um, and repairs has clearly been an issue. Um, the funding by being put into the general fund will, I'm sure, be used appropriately, but it can be used on anything. It, it, it is no longer just tied to the house and the garden. So that clearly is our are very evident disappointment. And as Maurice Corey pointed out, um, the issue is knowing the, the two ladies at the time, and I didn't know them, um, but everybody locally tells me that their legacy was about the house and garden. It wasn't generally to contribute um, to the National Trust coffers. Can okay. I come in here, Jeff? Yeah. Sure. Um, and just clarify on, on the point that when I said 800,000, that was way back originally. It's obviously grown as a shrewd investment. But um, the way uh, Miss Henry died um, prior to uh, the, the, the will was made in such a way that it was legally uh, um, could be uh, the, the transfer of funds could be made to the, to the National Trust headquarters account. But what was agreed was that after much negotiation by the friends of Gielston is that the interest on that capital sum is allocated to Gielston House for the maintenance of gardens and, and, and obviously general repair of the roof, which had been redone. Um, so there was an element of, of, of coming towards the Friends of Gilson with, with, with income. Um, but the capital sum was not. Um, and there's a legal issue around that, um, but why that is still in place. Um, and uh, when it's been looked at, the will, um, it clearly is, I can't remember, I'm just not aware of the title, there's a particular term used, but it's, it's a legacy not a will, which is which means that it can be used across the properties generally in national trust. So there's a legal argument here about that, but they managed to win the interest off it, which is something. So I think by using that as an example, as an, exa as an example, um, that, that they've, they've moved some way to coming towards the friends of Gilson's um, um, wishes, but not far enough, and, and that's the point. So. You could say that uh, the board of the National Trust of Scotland have realised there's an issue here and, and to go the way to give the interest certainly is obviously a help, but let's go a bit further and have the, have the capital sum allocated purely to Gilson House, which is what I am convinced is what um, Elizabeth Henry wanted um, because the way that she wanted to bequeath it was clearly for Gilson and the people of Cardross. I have to say that it sort of rings, this sort of story sort of rings similar to something that's happened in my own area over a period of time. Um, you know, I, I think Bell Isle has been in the, the, the news again. Uh, obviously, the, 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 the property there has burned down. But uh, having been there as a kid and I'm taking my own children there as well, and the way that has been allowed to deteriorate, um, um, it sort of rings true what you're saying here. So I have a lot of sympathy for. Uh, for, for what um, colleagues are saying, what the petitioners are saying. And the other thing that strikes me very much um, at Convener is, is um, around the fact that, 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 that this, you know, it seems to me that if the money was bequeathed specifically with, with the thought in mind to, and it seems t entirely reasonable to assume that the money was bequeathed to, uh, to maintain the property, it, 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 does, it might not be illegal, but it does seem slightly immoral that uh, they would they would take take that, that money for, for other projects so I am certainly minded to to uh, look a little bit deeper into this uh, into this uh, petition uh, convener okay thank okay. you um, yeah I, I, I would tend to agree I've got a lot of sympathy for the petition and it, it's, it doesn't seem to be a an unreasonable ask um, that's contained in it and clearly um, the petitioners have a strong support um, from Jackie Bailey and Morris Corey, um, so uh, it's it's um, it's it's heartening to see that um, that, that, that there is such uh, cross-party local support for it. Um, w with regard to next actions, um, do we have any suggestions as to what uh, we should do with this petition? Well, I think we should 
right to the um, Scottish Tourism Alliance to um, ask, is there a reason that National Trust Scotland um, isn't included within their board or within their uh, strategic tourism um, plans for Scotland? Um, there may be a valid reason for that, um, but it would be good uh, to find out. Um, I think we should write to the Scottish Government to uh, understand uh, the outcome, the you know, the the outcome, that the contribution from the National um, Trust properties um, and the contribution of the footfall. I think it's very important, um, you know, what they do contribute to Scotland. But um, other than that, of course, we need to um, eke out some more details from National Trust um, with regard to some of the points that have been made um, today. And perhaps get a little bit more information from Gilston Gardens on the evidence that we have heard today. Indeed. Um, I would agree. I think we need to um, seek the, the, the views of the petition, um, the, the, the Scottish Government's view of the petition, and also to ask the National Trust uh, to respond to the petition and also provide a copy of the uh, study that uh, Jackie Bailey referred to, um, and also to comment on uh, the points that have been raised by uh, the two local members. Um, I believe the Digital Culture, and, uh, Media and Sport Committee has an inquiry on the contribution of gardens to the economy, um, which I think is live, so um, this committee will uh, alert that committee to the, 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 the petition uh, that, that uh, we're discussing this morning. Um, we also need to seek the views of the Scottish Tourism Alliance and Visit Scotland. And as uh, Rachel Hamilton has said, uh, Friends of Gilston uh, will uh, have a chance to respond to uh, what's been discussed this morning and also uh, anything that comes back from um, the, the various bodies that have been, uh, been mentioned. Um, so are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. OK, thank you. And thanks to Jackie Bailey for coming along and also to Maurice Corrie. I think it's right. convener and you. to the committee. Yeah, thank you also to both of you. Okay, thanks. Um, we'll suspend briefly uh, for the moment just to take um, the witnesses for the next evidence session uh, to allow them to get to their places. Thank you. Okay, if we can um, reconvene the meeting um, to discuss PE 1671 on uh, the sale and use of glue traps. Um, this is part of uh, agenda item two, which is a uh, uh, consideration of continued petitions. Um, as I say, the first continued petition is PE 1671 on the sale and use of glue traps lodged by Andrea Goddard and Lisa Harvey on behalf of Let's Get Mad for Wildlife. 
Uh, at a previous consideration of this petition in December 2018, we agreed to invite the Pest Management Alliance to give evidence at a future meeting, and representatives from the Pest Management Alliance will give evidence today. So I welcome uh, D. Ward Thompson of the British Pest Control Association, uh, John Hope of the National Pest Technicians Association, and Tom Bell of the Royal Environmental Health Institute of Scotland. So thank you for attending uh, this morning. Um, you have an opportunity to provide a brief opening statement of up to no more than five minutes, after which we'll move to questions from the committee. So over to you. Good morning. Thank you. I think the plan is to have a very brief uh, introduction, if that's OK. Um, the Pest Management Alliance acknowledges the potential for cruelty to be caused to target and non-target species by the use of uh, sticky boards. However, we recognise the need to protect public health if an imminent risk presents itself, um, and we look forward to informing the, the process. Okay, thank you. Um, well, if I could start with the, the first question. Um, in your submission in November 2018, you acknowledged proposals put forward by the petitioners with regard to the Code of Practice and indicated that you would look at a potential redraft of the Code uh, with a particular focus on the training aspect. Um, can you advise the committee if this has been done, and if so, when you expect it to come into effect? Uh, hi. Um, yeah, so the revision is still ongoing. Um, we have looked at making some revisions, um, particularly around uh, that the reasons why or when um, that they could be used. However, um, we're still in that process of draft in that document, so we haven't got a final document today. Um, within regards to the training, we are looking at developing a training course. Um, again, that's in uh, progress at the moment. So a training course that people would be, be able to take online or a classroom course. Um, however, the RSPH level two, which is currently um, the main qualification or the base qualification um, that we use for pest control, um, does actually cover the use of sticky boards. So it is being covered. However, we are looking at developing an individual training course. OK, and, and do you have a timeline for, for that? Um, and also a timeline for the Code of Practice? Coming uh, the Code of Practice uh, should be ready soon. I don't know whether John can... Yeah, I, th I think um, we looked at the Code of Practice and there are various points about the petition that make sense. Um, but to be fair, we wanted to see if there was any recommendations came out of this committee today as to how you think it should possibly proceed, because what we didn't want to do would be to issue a code of practice, new code of practice, um, and then end up in a situation where we had to send out another revision quite quickly. So it is in progress. It, I would say three to four months would be the maximum time we'd need to develop that. OK, thank you. Um, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Gavina. Good morning to the panel. I think uh, just, just going back to the code, as I understand it, it applies or will only apply uh, to organisations and pest controllers who are members of the Pest Management Alliance. I just wondered how binding uh, what you think this code will be? Um, well, the, the code itself has been around for a very long time. So the Pest Management Alliance um, comes together whenever there's any um, significant issues or subjects that we feel strongly about where we want to pull the whole industry together and come together as a group. So we're made up of the different pest control associations and the CIEH and REHIS and um, a group called MPAP. Um, and we wrote the Code of Best Practice a very long time ago. So the original version was around 2010. Um, because we realised the importance of making sure that these products were used safely um, and only when needed, and to give guidance and assurance um, that that was taking place within the professional uh, pest management. Um, all of our members of the different associations sign up to the pest management codes of best practice. Um, we currently only have three, so it's very important that all of our members do adhere to them. Uh, we issue them when people become members, and then obviously we have an audit process where we audit our members. Um, and they're generally, you know, all of our members will adhere to any codes of best practice that the organisations sign up to. Um, so 
we, we don't watch all of our members all the time, but we can say that, you know, professional pest controllers will follow the codes of best practice set down by the organisations and set down by PMA. So, what training over and oversight then do you propose putting in place to ensure uh, compliance? Sorry, was that with the code of best practice? Yes. With the code of best practice. Um, all, all members that, you know, I can only speak for our organisation when they join, but they all go through um, a process of being uh, taken through all of the codes of best practice. Um, and then we have online training that they can do, which is specifically in the code of best practice. Um, within the pest management industry, we have CPD. So we have a CPD scheme. Um, which is only on pest control, so it's not a broad subject CPD, it's all on pest control. Um, and there will be CPD courses and webinars on all of the codes of best practice that we have as an organisation. And I think John's yeah. very similar. Yeah, I think it would be fair to say that the vast majority, well, in fact, I would say virtually all of, of members of both associations do adhere to that code of best practice when it comes to glue boards. Um, as Dee says, that the, 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 the COP has been around now for a number of years and it's well entrenched within the pest control industry. And I, you know, if I were to give you a figure on the, the amount of complaints, because we do have a robust um, system with dealing for complaints with anything um, that comes to us with regard to our members. And I've dealt with one complaint in the last 12 months regarding that, which I upheld. Um, and we, we went through a process of dealing with that individual member and just retraining and re-advising them and we revisit. So it is a very robust process that we have in place, as I'm sure the British Pest Control Association do. And as I say, it, it is well entrenched. What isn't so well entrenched, though, is um, the availability of the boards to amateur users. And in that situation, you know, the boards that are provide, provided by pest control suppliers um, will have the code of best practice printed on the back of them. Um, they will have the, the various pest control companies that buy those products. Well, their, their staff will have gone through training to use those products. As Dee said, RSPH2. Although we are looking at um, a new training program specifically around glue boards, but when it when it regards when it comes to amateur use boards, no such controls exist, and you'd only have to go on to Amazon or eBay or any of those um, uh, various um, platforms to be able to just buy boards and use them however you like. And I think for us that has always been a big concern. Um, but pro professional users. They, 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 like I say, it's well entrenched and we do use them properly. I, th I think that, I mean, I, I was going to go on to that, this, this um, you know, th for the pest controllers who aren't members or even for those amateur uh, uh, um, people are trying to do, do pest control, you can't ensure adherence then. Can I ask them, would, would, you, would you then advocate that uh, the use of glue boards should only be for um, those who are, you know, professional pest controllers and, and, and potentially members of your organisation? 100%. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Rachel Hamilton. Welcome. Uh, I'd like to pick up on uh, that point, actually. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary had intended to introduce restrictions on the sale and use of glue traps. Is there any... Uh, at the point of sale, what happens when somebody goes... You mentioned, I think, Amazon, so online sales. How does somebody who's a, a, aware of the code of practice and is a specially trained practitioner, can they purchase glue traps or can anybody purchase glue traps? And is there anything in place to stop those who aren't uh, trained to purchase glue traps? I would say certainly from the pest control provide the, the uh, professional pest control provider market, there will be they will have certain customers who have accounts with them that are from pest control companies. With regard to being able to buy glue traps, just as a member of the general public online or even in a, a on a market stall, there's there's no restrictions in place at all for that to happen. Uh, do you believe that there should be something in place? With regard to the amateur market, certainly. Okay. And have you, um, as an alliance, looked at 
controlling that? I think, to be fair, that's quite difficult for us to control. You know, we, we deal with the pest control suppliers on, on a regular basis, and there are discussions around, you know, only providing glue bores to professional users. Um, and, you know, I, would, I think it's fair to say they've all come on board, which is why I say the code of practice is printed on the back of their boards. The boards that you will buy from a, um, a market stall, for example, you won't have that code of best practice, and people do not know how to use them. And the petition's right in saying that these boards do have the potential to cause suffering. And I think it would be, you know, you know, I've been I've been in this industry nearly 30 years now, and I would and I would argue that the people that work within this industry do not have any um, any agenda around causing suffering. In fact, the absolute opposite is true. And I think we're in we're in a world now where. Um, there are restrictions uh, on many products. There are, there are difficulties around controlling rodents um, these days because I think the thing to bear in mind, and I know I'm going off your uh, question, but at the point I'm trying to make is the need to keep these for public health use. But there are difficulties around rodent control now with regard to um, uh, intolerance to cereal baits and behavioural resistance with uh, going to bait boxes and, and the like. So I think we need to keep the armoury we have, providing we use it properly, which is why as we, us as the PMA recognised that we needed to have controls over these measures and why we brought the Code of Practice in in the first place. I, I mean, just to respond to that, I think it's um, devaluing you know, the irresponsible use is devaluing what, as an alliance, you are trying to set out um, with your code of practice. And, um, I, you know, I find it quite horrific that those people who don't know how to use the traps are being able to use them. Um, I wanted to ask you about the code of practice. Another question. Uh, who are you consult you, you did say you wanted to uh, wait and see what happened here today um, as to uh, the committee, uh, how we would guide you. Um, I'm not an expert, so I don't think I'll be able to guide you, but I wondered who you will consult to shape the code of practice. Who you, will you bring on board to, um, to, to allow you to make this more robust, if that's what you're after? We've already consulted, so we've been in uh, consultation with different organisations, so uh, DEFRA, Natural England, um, and uh, we're also speaking to representatives from Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, you know, because we cover um, all of those within our membership base. Um, it's always very difficult when you're trying to rewrite something that's been in place for many years because it has worked effectively. Um, and sometimes, you know, you can get to the point where you make it too big and it doesn't become a code of best practice anymore it becomes a guidance document so um, it is it is quite a, a lengthy process and we, we're trying to make sure that we we don't make it too wordy therefore people don't follow it um, I think what we'll probably end up doing is is having two documents so our, because for me a code of best practice is just that it's what you must do and you shall do this and you shan't do that um, whereas a guidance is more about the how um, and what we try to do with all of our codes of best practice, and as I say, with the Pest Management Alliance, there's only three, because there's only three subjects that we feel that strongly about that we need to have a code of best practice, um, is to keep it, keep it nice and short. Um, I think what we'll end up is having a additional guidance for people to understand. At the point of sale, is the code of best practice given with the product? I, I know you can't track that online, but is that something... It, obviously, there's instructions, but is, it, is there a code of best practice that is available to those people who are irresponsibly using it and are not trained? Uh, responsible sellers, so manufacturers of these products, um, will have the code of best practice printed and will supply, but there are lots of sellers that, that won't there'll be no controls at all. And I think that's one of the biggest issues with the amateur with the amateur market. Anybody in this room could go and buy them and have them delivered by tomorrow from China or America, anywhere, um, because of the there's no controls at all. Um, but there's, there's no regulation within pest management at all. 
So the pest management industry has always been self-regulating. So the campaign for responsible redenticide use um, is voluntary, a voluntary uh, sale and use, which was done for redenticides to keep the AVK actives. Um, and that's, that's self-stewardship. Um, aluminium phosphide is also stewardship by voluntary means and by working with an organisation called RAMPS. Um, and then the PMA, we have kind of like our stewardship, which is a very stringent code of best practice, but it's, it's, it's all voluntary. Um, and if products can be gained for amateurs, then you're always going to have this issue um, of trying to control point of sale, which I think would be very, very difficult. Okay, I've got another question, if that's okay. Uh, Mr Hope, you spoke about um, having one complaint in the last year. I just wondered if there ever have been any practitioners that have been struck off because of irresponsible use. I've been in position about 12 months, so I can't answer for what goes before. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, no. Um, certainly not in the last 12 months. But I think, to be fair, I think to, to, to strike people off and to remove them from an association can be counterproductive. I think it's far better to work with people and, and retrain and educate them rather than to send them down a road to oblivion where they will continue to practice, but they'll continue to practice without any potential repercussions. Because as Dee says, we're not a regulated industry, but what we are good at is self-regulation. So one last point, which kind of rounds off what I've been talking about. Um, under what circumstances do you believe that glue traps should be used and do you think that's specific enough in the code of conduct so there's a clear <coughs> message? Right. I think uh, I understand where you're going with this and I understand what the petition's saying. Um, that code of best practice does demonstrate or does dictate that glue board should only be used as uh, a last resort when all other control me measures have failed or if there's an imminent risk to public health. And, the, uh, and I can give you various examples of that. Um, the, the obvious one would be somewhere like a hospital operating theatre where a mouse or a rat gets in and you don't want to wait or the, the customer um, or the pest controller doesn't want to wait two weeks for anticoagulant baits to start working. And in that situation, I would advocate their use. What I can say is, like I say, I've been in this job for about 30 years now. I've probably used glue balls about 10 times. So they're not commonplace, but we, we but what we can't be in a situation, what, well, we can't, we can be in a situation, but what I wouldn't like to see is a situation where they were removed from our armory because, as, as a last resort. And that's, that's all they ever are used for. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, if I could uh, stay with the, or stick with the, the code of practice for, for a wee bit longer. Um, we understand uh, that it was revised in 2017. Um, how many times has it been revised since uh, 2010 uh, and what motivated the 2017 revision? Um, I think there's been three revisions in total. Um, as with most codes of best practice that are done through the PMA, we do have a, a revision process, so we will look at all of our codes of best practice on an annual basis. Um, so it's, it's just a natural progression. Um, I, d I don't think there was any in particular reason that prompted the, the revision, apart from just the normal, the normal process. Um, thanks. Um, the, the petitioner's submission of September 2018 it provided a, a range of suggestions for improvements to the, the code. Now, you've uh, acknowledged those comments, but can you indicate which or any of the suggestions might feature in the, the revised code? Um, and can I ask if you've contacted the petitioners directly to, to seek their views? No, we haven't uh, contacted the petitioners directly. Um, we will take on board vet the various aspects of it. But as Dee says, what we don't want to do is to make it too overly cumbersome. And, you know, various things, various... Um, uh, emotional statements uh, or potentially emotional statements around the need for suffering. I think that, again, is something that our members are fully aware of. And, and, and I'll come back 
to the amateur use market area of it where there are no controls in place at all. Okay, so would it be possible for you to provide um, a copy of the, the the draft of the redraft uh, of the, the code of practice so that the a the petitioners can look at it uh, and also that we can look at it as a as a committee um, I think it would be helpful if we could have sight of it uh, at an early stage is would that be possible yeah no absolutely yeah we'll we'll work we'll continue to work on redrafting it. Um, I think it is, it's pretty comprehensive it, it, as it is from my own personal point of view, but we're, we, we'll take on board the petitioner's point of view. And as soon as we've carried out a redraft, we'll more than happily send you a copy of it before it goes to um, submission to the general pest control population. Okay. And the timeline for that is? If we say three to four months, would yeah. that be reasonable, Dean? Okay. Right. Any other points? Um, Brian Whittle. I, th I think we'd, we'd all agree that, in, in, in general, pest control should be uh, left to professional pest control management. Yeah. Um, but to me, the, the idea that, that, that to practice pest control, you do not have to be a member of the Pest Control Alliance, and, and, it's, and it's not obligatory to be a member. So therefore, the, the problem for me is that if, if you have no intention of following that code of practice, you will not become a member of the Pest Control Alliance. It, it's, it's, to me, there's a big hole in that. So. If we're, if we're actually really going to try and close um, uh, to close a loophole here, uh, uh, we'd have to ask the Scottish Government if they're, they're prepared to, to, to legislate in any way here. Mm. Uh, other, other, otherwise, um, those who are, who are non-compliant with the, the code of, of practice can continue doing what they're doing with, mm. with, with no recourse. So, uh, you know, I, I'm to I, I totally understand where the petition is coming from here and, and would support it. Um, but actually, it, 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 in these, how do we enforce that? And the only way I can see that is, is some kind of legislation that requires membership of a, of a, of a, of a body. So I don't know where we go with that, um, can be now. Okay, thanks. Um, well, I mean, that's something obviously that, uh, that, that can be considered. Um, but I think uh, in the first instance, we need to reflect on the the evidence that we've taken this morning and uh, discuss further actions at, um, at a future meeting. However, um, clearly we are keen to, to see the, the finalised code and um, ideally if that's done within three months then all well and good. But um, I think we'll perhaps, I would suggest that we perhaps reserve the, the option to invite um, the PMA back to present the finalised version uh, to the committee, uh, possibly in November, December, if it's if it's provided by um, say October. Um, but we would clearly need a copy of the uh, code in advance, and ideally a copy of the the redrafted code uh, before that. So, um, are members ag agreeable that we'll uh, discuss it further at a future meeting? Are you agreed I to that? Agreed. Okay, um, thanks very much for uh, giving evidence this morning. Um, it's very much appreciated and uh, we may or may not see you back here at some point in the not too distant future. Thank you. Oh, I, uh, can I suspend briefly uh, to allow uh, members? Yep, no, sure.
can I reconvene uh, the meeting? Um, uh, can I welcome again uh, Jackie Bailey and Maurice Corey, who have stayed for the uh, petition on a permanent solution for the A83, which is PE1540. Um, it's lodged by Douglas Filland and uh, is calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to ensure that there's a permanent solution for the A83 at the rest and be thankful, uh, ensuring the vital lifeline route is not closed because of landslides. Um, following our last consideration of the petition on the 6th of December 2018, we've received a written submission from the Scottish Government. The submission confirms that it has conducted a programme of engagement and consultation, including work on the A83 as part of its review of the National Transport Strategy, which is expected to be published by the end of 2019. The submission also confirmed that the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity intended to meet with our Gail and Butte Council in early 2019 to discuss the emerging vision, outcome and policies of the strategy and what they mean for our Gail. Uh, with regard to tree planting measures that have been put in place uh, to help reduce the risk of landslips, uh, landslips at the rest and be thankful, this submission explains that work on this would begin in early 2019. So do members have any comments or would you like to hear from the local members first? Okay, <laughs> okay um, who would like to go first? Okay, so, uh, I mean, I'll go first. Um, no, I think I know quite a lot about this. Uh, I was a councillor elected in 2012 to Argyll Butte Council, and I sat on the Roads Committee. I was the vice convener of it. Um, and this option was very much top of our list, so it's been going on for a very, very long time. Um, and uh, just to put you in, 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 uh, in picture of this, um, yesterday, as late as yesterday, I had some photographs taken on the site, on the on the, the area of um, the rest to be thankful, and as to date, as of last night, there's no planting taking place at all. And in fact, the area they refer to about going for private sale of the forestry, the sale board for sale board is still up at the bottom of the glen, so there is no move on that. All right. Um, and I know there's some issues with uh, the Forestry Commission in relation to harvesting the trees at the bottom of the glen, which is the beginning of the rest of me, thankful, because there's real concerns about hydrology, and this is like we identified in 2012, because you start taking those off the hill. Just, just to give you a bit of a background, originally, uh, way back in farming times, and, and, and those people who are farmers amongst us will probably know better than me, but um, there was an allocation of hillside given to the local farmers. And those cattle and those sheep would go on to the sides of rest and be thankful. And the sheer way they work by going around and contouring, they, they stamp in the, the, the soil, and that forms a barrier to any slides. Well, they don't have sheep and cattle on the hill anymore. That's not encouraged. So there is a fundamental natural problem. And then furthermore, that once the forestry people harvest their trees, they completely change the hydrology, so the water can, situation gets worse. Um, so that's why there's a dilemma. And there's no use the government hiding behind you know, various studies and reviews and yet another review and digging holes, and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, it is not the solution to it. I mean, unless you pile it with cattle and make up for those lost years on the hill, you're not going to solve it. Um, it has got to be a dramatically different situation. And so what we as council at that time looked at four options, well, certainly a couple of major options. One was to cover the, the road with the Swiss type of avalanche um, guards, like a tunnel, an open tunnel, so open side down. And the, the worry there was that by doing that, the, the sheer drop on the road on the, on, the, on the left as you go up is quite severe, that maybe the rock might give way. So that was rather ruled out. Uh, the other one was to put the, uh, the blue option, which it was, was to go on the south side of Glen Crow, which was through the forestry ground. They had granted permission from Ardgarten up the top of the connection where you go down, the, you turn left and you go down to Loch Galhead and on up to, to, to Inverary. Um, that was £40 million. Pounds. Well, currently, I gather, the spend on what they're doing is not far off £60 million already spent. And Jacobs are there, and we still have single-file traffic. We still have delays of up to 15 minutes. Um, that's non-summertime traffic, OK? So you can understand how people are getting uh, frustrated. There are continual landscape issues, uh, Chair, um, and this is a geological problem. It's nothing... You know, it is the fact of life. Um, and the, when I went up with them only three days ago, um, I couldn't believe the holes. It's like a sort of massive tooth filling uh, on the side of the hill, and the other side you've got the sheer drop. 
and what's holding it together is the road. Well, I leave it to your imagination, okay? So it is quite a serious issue, and I do not think the government have got it, okay? That's my point, and Transport Scotland, and we, we as a council, and we as uh, myself as a council regent, and now as a member of part Scottish Parliament, same with Jackie Bailey, my colleague, we've been pushing, and Jackie sits on the task force. Nothing seems to be, I'm not blaming her, but I'm just saying the Scottish government end is nothing <laughs> seems to have... No, 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 absolutely right. No, 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 it's not that. It, I mean, it, it is, and I know from the task force, from other people on it as well, it's, it's frustrating, and I think you'll agree with me on that, Jackie. Um, the, as I say, so um, what is it doing? What's the effect of all this? The cause and effect. The effect is confidence in economic development in Nagal and the Isles. Point blank. We have a population um, de uh, de uh, reduction of 10%. Uh, that's about 9,000 over the next 10 years. Um, people are making active decisions not to invest in Argyle and the Isles. Uh, they are also tourists are finding other routes to go and not the other road. And once they find another route, they'll go somewhere else. Um, and it's becoming, it is a vital link to the Isles and, and, and to the West Coast. Uh, it has got fish traffic, it's got uh, people from the quarries, it's got all sorts of forestry, logging, all that that comes down there. And yet we still cannot get the message through to the government that they've got to do something absolutely dramatic. As I say, no, no planting of trees, delays and files on, on the traffic situation, that leads to frustration and possible accidents. And as I say, once new routes are discovered, people move forward. And obviously business is lost, economic development is less attractive, and the population reduces. Now, quite clearly there are options available to them, um, and that is basically to put the road up the south side of Glencroe, which I said earlier was the blue option. Um, the other one is to go straight up the middle of Glencroe, Glencroe uh, and tunnel through the shoulder, which is another option. Uh, to the top of the, the, the Glen, and then it comes out at what's called the Devil's Bridge at the other side, under the Lochan, um, because the, the old hill climb road is not usable anymore. It is now being ruled out by health and safety, and I've talked to the Royal Scottish um, Automobile Club, and they've agreed that that is not, uh, in this Parliament, uh, an issue anymore. So there's no worry about tradition. We can have nice thoughts about it, but we can use that, and I know it's the relief road at the moment. But that's not adequate. I mean, it's, this is back in the art times, I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, so my plea to the committee is, look, this needs a radical rethink. Um, we need a radical solution. We need, if necessary, UK government help on this. Uh, the option of a tunnel is not cheap, but it has been done on the Faroes. If we go out and look at the Faroe Islands, they've joined all the islands up through the, the Danish government, have done that beautifully. All we want is something like that, a very simple tunnel at the top and a road up the middle. And I'm sure the landowner would come to some agreement on the sale of the land. So I would ask you to maybe to, to look at that and, and really call for other options than just another review by the Cabinet Secretary. Okay, Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, Convener. The double act continues for this petition <laughs> at least. Um, can, can I say that this is actually at the edge of my constituency. The impact on my constituency is significant. The impact on Mike Russell's constituency, because his constituents need to travel this route, is even greater still. And I'm sure he would echo many of the comments made. Um, I attended the last A83 task force meeting. It was in the last few weeks in Arica, um, and we received an update on progress in stabilising um, the hillside at the rest and be thankful. Um, it is frustrating, and particularly for local people. Um, I'm not going to rehearse the options that Morris did, because I think that's probably not, that detail is not for the, the, the committee itself. However, what he has illustrated is that there's a wide number of options that would provide a permanent solution. And that's what local people want. They want a permanent solution so that every two minutes the hillside is not collapsing and blocking up the road. The diversion takes you, you know, all through some beautiful parts of Scotland, but can take up to 40 minutes. That, that's a fundamental, um, you know, the, the length of time that that takes is fundamentally damaging to the economy of that local area. Um, so local people are very anxious. We know it's got a severe impact. We know that it impacts on people socially, economically. It impacts on people getting to hospital, ambulances getting through. Um, it is such an important part, an infrastructure part of life um, in Argyll and Butte. Um, I do know that work is ongoing. Um, I know that the Scottish Transport Projects Review is now underway and government officials actually had a consultation event just prior to the task force meeting and that was very helpful. I think they were left in no doubt about the priority that the A83 has, has and indeed the A82 as well. 
Um, and they have been working, the Scottish Government, with Arc Island Butte Council to make sure that it's a priority <coughs> within the Scottish Transport Projects Review. Um, and we need that investment to find a permanent solution. Um, so we are at a critical stage. And whilst things do appear to be moving ahead, I would ask the Petitions Committee not to close the petition, but actually to seek an update from the Scottish Government on what's happening both with the task force and the interim measures they're taking, but also with the Scottish Transport Projects Review, because that will be the critical vehicle that provides the investment for the permanent solution. Thank you, convener. OK, thank you. Um, committee members, do you have any yeah. views? Can I Brent? ask a daft laddie question? Of course. Uh, yes. Um, and a lot of these situations, it seems to me, it's, it's you know, we, we we are responsible for for um, destabilising uh, uh, land by clearing it for all sorts of um, reasons. And I think it's just my question is: do, do we know what the natural vegetation would be if we'd left it alone in the first place? Because nature's very good at looking after itself. Well, I think, I, think um, I, mean, I mean, it's always been a forestry area. In other words, they've always had trees on it and they've taken it off it. Uh, but I think that going back uh, on, the, on the side of the hill now, on the south side, which is where the problem is, is that's where a lot of cattle and, and sheep were originally when the farmers used it. So now you're coming to a situation where they're harvesting it, but there's no, there's no animals. And that's the problem they've got. They've lost the naturalness of it. So had it been left alone and had farming policy been you know, static, I think we wouldn't have had a problem. But modern things move on. And obviously, it weren't the incentive to put the cattle on the hill. Would you, would you not should say then that the, that the solution here is, is proper planting to stabilise the hillside and leave it alone? I don't know. I, don't, I mean, it, when you see some of the, the rocks that have, are poised to come down and have come down, I mean, um, it just takes a deluge of rain to bring the whole lot down. And that's one of the problems you've got, and you can't control that. Um, I don't know if the, if the hills are... If, I mean, it's going to take... Well, they've said already it's 15, 20 years before they get into any effect. I mean, that's... You know, that's 20,000 population gone. I just think yeah, sure. it's a really frustrating... Uh, situation. It's really shabby. Um, so many stakeholders involved, so little progress. I mean, this, I, I'm not sure, I need to uh, ask the clerks, was this petition first lodged in 2014? I mean, how ridiculous. You're losing investment, you're losing tourism, you're losing, you know, economic growth, particularly in a rural area uh, of where we're talking. Um, I just think it's absolutely disgraceful. Um, I think there's so many things here that uh, are, are an unknown. Morris, you mentioned the um, situation with the, the hillside. Uh, Transport Scotland continues to work with landowners to conclude the private sale. You say that there's still a sign up. Um, Jackie, you're on the task force. Doesn't seem to be much movement there. Um, what is it that the Scottish Government to can do to call on uh, we can call on urgent action um, for this to be bumped up in the list of priorities um, with uh, strategic transport projects I think in in fairness to the Scottish government I think they've recognized the need to find a permanent solution um, so there have been early discussions with our Island Butte Council um, and consultants have been brought in um, to recognize that actually when the Scottish Transports Project Review concludes, we want to be able to start work straight away. Um, now, I'm not technical. I'm not going to comment on what the most appropriate solution is. Um, I'll confine myself to simply expressing the frustration of local constituents requiring a solution. I will leave that to the experts to find out what that solution is. But work is underway to ensure that it is taken as a priority the minute the Transport Review is concluded. And just another point on that. Is there that a mechanism in place to be able to, to do that? So everybody wants infrastructure projects. Everybody wants their um, issues prioritised on their roads. How do you make this a priority? What, are the criteria, what is the criteria? Um, I, you would need to invite that information from the Scottish Government, but my understanding is they actually have consultants working alongside our Guile and Butte Council, so it can be practically one of the first projects off the stocks, but you would need to confirm that with the Scottish Government. Can I add, sorry, it may be possible to, to write to the Council itself 
mm. and ask them what's That's a good idea. Mean. I would suggest you do that because you might get a different story. Okay, Brian, do you want Sorry. to go on? Yeah, J just, I'd, I'd be really, really interested to understand where this sits within uh, the, the development of the STPR2, um, because that, 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 will, that will not report uh, for another couple of years. That will not, that'll not get to, mm -hmm. to that, that position. So uh, if it sits within, it would be interesting to, to ask the Scottish Government where that sits within the STPR2, if, if it sits within the, that, that, that uh, STPR2 uh, report, or whether it can sit outside the side of that and something be done um, at a sooner date, because as I say, it'll be another two years before that actually actually um, is written. Yeah, I, I would think it, it would have to sit outside uh, the STPR, but um, as Jackie Bailey has uh, rightly highlighted, we've got the Scottish Transport Projects Review underway, and wearing another hat, uh, my Eclair committee took evidence uh, a few weeks ago on that, and and they are thinking out the box. You know, they're talking. They're look well. They're looking at you know ferries. Uh, sorry, tunnels instead of ferries in some parts of Scotland, and they're looking at a 40-year uh, uh, plan. So um, I would hope that uh, that this uh, issue. Is, is a priority and dealt with uh, first and foremost. Um, I mean, I can clearly share the frustration of uh, the petitioners. Um, it has been going on for, for some time. I remember um, before the election in the previous session, uh, this committee had a site visit to the rest and be thankful. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't make it. I was taking evidence in Sky on land reform on the same day, so I was a bit disappointed that I couldn't get to the rest and be thankful. But it has been uh, an issue for for some time, uh, and it needs to be drawn to a conclusion. Um, given the frustration from everybody, um, would it would members be minded to invite the cabinet secretary to give evidence, oral evidence here, uh, just to try and increase the Pressure. I'm, I'm, I'm always, I'm always love, love, lovely to welcome the cabinet secretary. As you know, <laughs> yeah. um, I think, I think in this particular, that'd be a very good, uh, at least get, at least get some feel from the Scottish government um, of where they feel they are with us. So be, I think that'd be quite a good. Um, yeah. Morris also um, asked us to get uh, evidence from the Argyll and Butte Council. Yeah. I'll just quickly ask Jackie, what, who is in the task force? Um, the councils represented in the task force, local stakeholders attend, community councils, so everybody really that, that is uh, affected by this, including the Scottish Government and the operator um, on behalf of the Scottish Government, Transport Scotland, everybody, basically. Okay, so it's on everybody's radar. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, I mean, obviously we have the option of contacting the Scottish Government uh, now and, and asking um, for an update on the uh, STPR in relation to the A83. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, uh, their opinion of how the A83 task force is, is working and, and progress on that. Uh, and also the hillside planting yeah. uh, that was expected to commence in early 2019, but Maurice Corrie is advising us that uh, there's no sign of anything happening, <laughs> happening, happening there yet. <laughs> and, and good to get the, the photos as well. So. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it would be helpful if um, uh, we get an update and then have the evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, and that, you know, obviously we'll get the update over recess and try and uh, diary the Cabinet Secretary in for, for an early meeting, in, uh, perhaps in September. Um, so, have we agreed to agreed. that course of action? Agreed. agreed. Okay. Well, thank you to Jackie Bailey, thank you to Maurice Curry and uh, sending his scout out yesterday to check. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. Um, we'll move on now to um, petition 1634 um, by Jessica Mason on equality in council tax payment options. It calls on the Scottish Government to clarify and improve current Scottish Council tax legislation in order to make Council tax payment over 12 months a mandatory option for Council taxpayers, as it is in England and Wales. Uh, we last considered this petition in April 2018, when we invited local authorities identified by the petitioner uh, as not offering a 12-month payment option to explain whether they would consider reviewing their approach. The, the clerk's note summarises the responses received from the local authorities, who all confirmed that, while not mandatory, 
they do offer a 12-month payment option on request from the council taxpayer. So, um, do members have any comments uh, on, on this petition or suggestions for action? I have huge sympathy with this, and I have not been involved in this petition uh, before, um, convener. Uh, I, I completely get that the local authorities are able to um, permit an individual to pay over 12 months, and the default is tends to be 10 months, as it is in my own council. But um, the, my sympathy lies with the petitioner because it's great for cash flow and it's great to take it off your mind. And a one-off payment is, is, you know, is, is a big amount. And if you do forget, um, which I have in the past, um, you do, I know it's terrible, um, but it's much easier to manage um, those monthly instalments. And I think, in my opinion, it should be... The council should um, be giving a communication that says that if somebody wants to pay over 12 months that they should. I don't think there's anywhere we can go any further with a mandatory op option, but I think that, that each local authority has, an, has, has a responsibility to help people with cash flow and ensure that if they want to pay over 12 months they, they should be able to. Okay. Right. Brian. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely in agreement with that. I think that... Um, I also have fallen full <laughs> of, of, that, of that as well, and, and, it's, um, and, and it, seem, it seems to me a quite, quite a harsh environment uh, when, when that happens. But uh, surely it's a council's responsibility to try and help help, help all the, the, the constituents of that, of that council. Um, and and uh, I would agree with Rachel Hamilton that uh, it should be it should be an option that's readily available. Um, and, and commu readily communicated as well, but uh, I'm not sure what, how, how much further we can go in terms of mandatory. We already know that the Scottish Government have no plans to amend uh, the, the regulation, um, but uh, that's not to say that, that I think the petitioner has done uh, a, a, very good, a very good service, a very good job in delivering this and bringing this to, to our attention, but I'm not sure what else we can currently do. Um, no, I mean, I, I agree uh, with, with uh, both members that um, local authorities could perhaps up their game with regard to uh, informing uh, tenants and residents that, um, that there is a 12-month option if, if they want, um, but that's clearly uh, maybe not the case in, in every local authority. I mean, making them aware, not, not the fact that the option is available. So uh, I don't think we have any other option. Uh, I think we've reached the end of the, the line with this and we've no other option but to close the petition under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders on the basis uh, that the Government has no plans to amend the relevant regulations and that local authorities have confirmed that they offer a 12-month payment option on request. Um, but could I thank the petitioner, uh, Jessica Mason, for bringing this issue to the Parliament's attention? Um, and she may well be disappointed that we're closing the petition, but I hope she has taken some comfort from the responses from uh, local authorities that a 12-month payment option is available on request. But, uh, of course, the option is always open to the petitioner to come back at a later date, after 12 months, uh, should she feel that uh, there's, there's, it's still an issue and it hasn't been addressed uh, to her satisfaction. But hopefully um, her own local authority will now uh, allow her to, to pay on a 12-month basis. So are we agreed to close the petition? OK, that's agreed. Um, if we can move on to um, petition 1653 uh, on active travel infrastructure lodged by Michaela Jackson on behalf of Gorebridge Community Trust. Uh, at our last consideration of this petition on 22nd of November 2018, we agreed to write to the Scottish Government to seek an update of the Trunk Road Walking and Cycling Initiative following the publication of the Active Travel Task Force report in June 2018. Uh, the Scottish Government's response states that the report contains 18 recommendations and that a de delivery plan is due to be published by the end of June 2019. We also sought an update on the review of the National Transport Strategy with regards to active travel matters. The Scottish Government highlighted that one of the draft strategy's themes is improves our health and wellbeing, which recognises a need for Scotland's transport system to enable a healthy, fit and safe nation and to allow people to make active travel choices to improve their wellbeing. 
The Scottish Government will consult on the draft National Transport Strategy in July 2019, with the final strategy expected to be published by the end of 2019. Uh, members will be aware that the Minister for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity made a statement in the Chamber earlier this week setting out plans for a uh, up to £51 million pound, um, that will be made available for walking and cycling infrastructure in 2019-20. So, do members have any comments or suggestions for actions? Um, yeah, I'll open it up to members at the moment. Uh, convener, if I may, um, again, I have um, huge sympathy for this, this particular petition. I have to say that I in the Transport Bill lodged an amendment that suggested that um, because they're doing these um, uh, low emission zones within uh, uh, within uh, 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 major cities that any money raised over and above administration should go on uh, an active travel policy rather than um, swallowed up by uh, the, the general budget. Um, disappointingly, <laughs> that particular amendment was, was, uh, was rejected, but it kind of speaks to, to exactly what the petitioner, I think, is trying to achieve here. Um, I think we'll also have to note that um, there has been a budget put in place by the Scottish Government specifically on active travel. Um, and the other thing I would suggest is that um, uh, it currently states, within, uh, certainly within the uh, development of major trunk roads, that active travel should be, uh, should be part of any development. That's not the case at the moment, um, I have to say. It's not necessarily adhered to all the time, but uh, um, what we do with it, with, with this particular pe uh, pe uh, petition now, um, given the, 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 uh, the, the government's uh, you know, increased focus on active travel, um, I'm not sure where, where this petition particularly goes now. Um, uh, Rachel Hamilton. Again, I think it's a fantastic petition, and I thank Michaela for bringing it forward, Michaela Jackson. Um, I am no, I, I have to uh, note that the, the petitioner was asked to provide a written submission, and to, to, that, to date, a response has not been received. So, again, that leaves us a, a bit hanging uh, because we can't make a decision. Um, as to you know what the petitioner, um, uh, what her reaction has been to the to the government announcement um, on funding, and also to the national transport strategy. So, um, I mean, I think it's a situation where perhaps we 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 only can read Michaela Jackson's mind that perhaps she is content with what the the pro progress that the Scottish government have been making, and therefore we we can't take this any further, as it stands. OK, thanks. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the petitioner has been invited to, to submit their view, but uh, hasn't uh, so far, although the, the, the £51 million announcement was just made this week, I believe. So mm. um, so it looks like we, we would have to close the petition under Standing Order Rule 15.7 on the basis that there are plans in place to address active travel regarding infrastructure projects in Scotland and opportunities to engage in the review of the National Transport Strategy, which has, has a, a focus on active travel. Um, but I would like to think that this petition has had some bearing on the government's announcement um, that £51 million will be made available for walking and cycling infrastructure in 2019-20. Uh, I'm sure it was on the government's radar. Um, but I would highlight the fact that the petitioner has the, the, the option to contribute to the, the consultation on the draft national transport strategy, uh, which will be uh, announced or, or open in July. Um, so perhaps if the clerks are contacting the petitioner, we can highlight that to, to her. So agreed to close the petition? Agreed. OK, thank you. Um, we now move on to uh, petition PE1691 on a review of the title conditions, bracket Scotland Act 2003. The petition was lodged by Christopher Hampton on behalf of the steering group of Bowman's View and calls for a review of the title conditions Scotland Act 2003, which prohibits a change of factor in the estate unless agreement is obtained by a two-thirds majority of owners in the estate, particularly in terms of the impact of that requirement on residents of sheltered accommodation. 
We last considered this petition in November 2018 when we considered submissions from the Scottish Government, the Law Society of Scotland and the Scottish Law Commission. Um, members will recall that those submissions did not directly support the action called for in the petition. The Law Society did not have a view on what an appropriate majority should be to implement a change of property factor, suggesting that this was a matter for the Parliament to determine. The Scottish Law Commission indicated that it had no plans to carry out a review of the legislation as it pertained to the petition, and the Scottish Government was clear that it had no plans to consult on changing the law on this issue. We invited the petitioner to respond to these submissions. Unfortunately, we didn't receive a response from the petitioner until the beginning of this week. Uh, members have a copy of the email that the petitioner sent to the clerks, and in that email he expresses dissatisfaction with the current position. He refers to the existing legislation as, uh, and I quote, well-intended, but unfortunately patronising and naive. He states that in the specific context and experience of the steering group of Bowman's view, uh, they have sadly experienced, and, and, sorry, and I quote, they, they have sadly experienced incomprehension and willful obstruction from certain authorities. Members will note that the petitioner says Neil Finlay MSP has been made fully aware of the situation and intends to raise the matter at parliamentary level. So do members have any comments or suggestions for action? Um, given that uh, the petitioner has stated that he is going to um, presumably his local MSP, um, it may well be the case that, and plus he, uh, it may well be the case that it's taken out of our hands, um, and there's a, a probably a, a strong option to close the petition under uh, Rule 15.7. Um, I, I, I have to agree with that. I think also the fact that. that, that, that uh, I, I recognise that the petitioner has now submitted to us, but we have we have been regularly asking him to submit and, and respond to uh, previous evidence sessions, um, and is now uh, is now uh, going to Neil Finlay's his local MSP to uh, to try and progress. I think uh, we have uh, we, we have little more that we can we can um, we can do here, and I would agree with you that it's, it's probably time to close the petition. Uh, can I also ask and clarify with the clerks that is this a legal case no. no okay it just it makes reference to a legal case and legal representation in the um, in the correspondence so I was just checking yeah it's, it's not a live legal case right okay thanks um, I, I think Neil Finlay MSP uh, could work very effectively on this specific uh, case which Mr Hamps Hampton has brought forward, perhaps more so than this committee can? Mm. Yeah, I'm sure he could. So, so that, well, therefore, I mean, reluctantly, I think we, could, we should close the petition, but if his own MSP doesn't get any further, he can then bring back the petition. He could. He's got that option to, to bring it back in 12 months' time if, uh, if, if we're minded to close it today. Agreed. So, agree. so OK, um, so we agree to close the petition under Rule 15.7 of standing orders on the basis that there's no support for the action called for in the petition. Agreed? Agreed. OK, thank you. Um, the next petition for consideration is PE 1709 on install CCTV and provide full-time social work support in all additional support needs schools, and this was lodged by Claire Mooney. If following our meeting on the 22nd of November 2018, a range of written submissions have been received, including a response from the petitioner. Um, the Scottish Government's submission outlines a number of safeguards that are in place to protect young people. The petitioner feels, however, that despite such safeguards, children attending additional support needs schools can, and in inverted uh, commas, fall through the, tracks, uh, the cracks. Um, in response to the aims of the petition, both Unison and NASUWT Scotland do not support the installation of CCTV cameras in schools. Unison is of the view that it could foster a culture of blame punishment. 
um, and concerns were also raised around possible infringements of human rights relating to privacy as well as GDPR implications. As an alternative, a number of submissions suggest further investment in requ is required in staffing and training as a means of ensuring the protection of children in additional support needs schools. In view of the Scottish Secondary Teachers Association, in, in their view, they've stated uh, CCTV cameras cannot be a replacement for the range of educational staff, but as an added technological advancement in addition to staff in, in making schools a place of safety for both pupils and staff. Uh, the Scottish Government submission confirms that the use of CCTV and the delivery of social work is a statutory matter for local authorities. From the written submissions received, their support for having a social work presence within additional support needs schools. However, the importance of multi-agency working in a school setting was stressed, for example, by NASUWT Scotland. At our last consideration of this petition, we agreed to investigate international comparisons on whether CCTV has been used in similar settings in other countries, and a SPICE briefing has been provided and is included in our papers. The briefing highlights that there are few documented examples of CCTV being used specifically in schools supporting children with complex additional support needs, and the closest examples that could be found were in the USA, Australia and India. So do members have any comments or suggestions for action on this petition? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the clerks for um, seeking the international examples. and. Uh, my issue is that um, there is no um, outcome that has been established yet, and there's so many voices that disagree on the use of CCTV. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm uh, getting the right conclusion here, but my own conclusion is that uh, there has been a reduction in the number of um, teaching staff and that teaching staff cannot be, that CCD cannot be a replacement for those educational staff. And it seems that a lot of the evidence um, suggests that investment in staff um, uh, is a way forward rather than CCTV. And the example in, uh, I think it was uh, Australia, is that with the use of CCTV, it could simply displace incidents to locations not covered by surveillance technologies. So it, it's really quite inconclusive because there's little international evidence um, and the, the un, unison um, and uh, NASUWT uh, are not really minded to support the installation of CCTV. So unfortunately, I have not, with this, I've not been able to come to uh, uh, my own conclusion. Okay, Brian Whittle. I think what, as an interesting aside, uh, I noted that Unison thought there might be a role for body cameras, mm. which actually, to, to, to me, would, would seem a better a, a, a better response, um, because because we have comparison, because we have um, you know, the police use uh, body cameras, so we have a comparison there, um, and, I, and I don't know whether that's a direction a direction of travel the petitioner or the petition would allow us to go in, but certainly I, I would probably like to quite ask Cosler their position on that, because I, I, think, I think it's a more practical solution to what, you know, in terms of protection of vulnerable children and also protection of those uh, who are working with them as well. I, I, can see, I, I, under, I understand completely where the petition is coming from here in terms of protect, protection of both those, those parties, but, but, but you know, where does that infringe on human rights? But I am of a mind to have a look at that, that option if, if the petitioner allows us to do that. Okay, well, we can check with the petitioner that, um, uh, to check if um, she's consent, uh, content for us to, to go down that route and, and uh, suggest that to COSLA in, in any letter that we send. Mm. Um, it's certainly worth uh, exploring that option as, as maybe a better uh, option than the overall CCTV and, and obviously taking on point, uh, taking the point of Rachel Hamilton that there could be a displacement of incidents if, you know, if, if a CCTV network was was in place. So um, are we agreed to write to COSLA uh, with that suggestion and see what comes back? Agreed. Uh, and, and obviously seek the um, petitioner's 
Uh, permission that um, that we go down that route. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Um, if we can move on to um, the final petition for consideration today, which is PE 1711 on first aid training for all primary school children in Scotland, lodged by Stuart Callison on behalf of St Andrews First Aid. Uh, at our last consideration of this petition, we took evidence from primary school pupils, a college student, a primary teacher and representatives from St Andrews First Aid. During this meeting, we heard about the inconsistent approach to the delivery of first aid training in schools across Scotland, as well as the importance of training young people in first aid as early as possible and ideally with uh, or by their class teacher. Um, we also heard that uh, compared to other European countries, Scotland performs poorly in terms of bystander interventions, first aid training and the number of current first aiders. The Scottish Government's written submission states that in respect of first aid training support for teaching staff in schools, COSLA has confirmed that schools already have their own arrangements in place for handling incidents by ensuring that sufficient numbers of school staff are trained in line with local requirements. The petitioner is of the view that this position is not sustainable or justifiable at a time when council finances are under such extreme pressure and suggests that the action called for in the petition could improve public health in Scotland at little cost. So do members have uh, any comments or suggestions for action? Yes, convener. <laughs> <laughs> I really like this petition, I have yeah, to say. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 th I think the petitioner has hit many nails on, on the head here. And one of the things that hasn't, I think the, the Scottish Government response uh, it didn't, didn't seem to grasp is, is, is not just in terms of the, the, the ability for, for more people to intervene uh, in, in, the, in, in, in times of, 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 of emergency, but also the fact that in learning this, this kind of um, uh, process empowers young people. And I, th and I think that I think that that cannot be underestimated. I I I, I certainly would like to to, to uh, continue to push this this particular uh, petition to see where it goes. Um, I would quite like to uh, write to uh, Cosla and the teaching unions to see what they they think they think of the petition. Um, I think I'd also I, I alluded to earlier in one of the other petitions. Look to see whether there's anything that we can compare to. From uh, internationally, that and perhaps because they said we are if we are quite far down the lead table in, in those sort of interventions, it would be interesting to see whether uh, that the, those that are higher up um, also have um, uh, sort of these interventions at school. So that, that would be my uh, recommendation. Okay. Um, Rachel, uh, I think it's a brilliant petition. Um, it, that was demonstrated when um, the the pupils came in and, and taught us uh, CPR and of course <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I beat Brian Whittle and uh, David That's Torrance <laughs> hands down um, so don't go near them when you need CPR but uh, I I think this is really important because I think um, it can run in parallel with the out-of-hospital cardiac strategy I do believe um, that it's a, a value for money um, initiative. Um, the petitioner says it's £1.36 per pupil, but we've got a disparity because it's a patchy, um, it's a pa it's, it's patchy across Scotland. Um, every local authority has the ability to be flexible and um, make it part of their wellbeing strategy um, through curriculum if they require, and the Cabinet Secretary has al already said that. Um, within some of the evidence, it suggests that the local authorities are wary about it because of cost and because of um, the burden on staff and also um, retaining staff and, and, and covering um, staff who, who are trained. Um, the petitioner recommends that uh, it's, I think, two teachers are trained per school. So um, I think, you know, let's look at the cost. It's not that much. What is, what, what is holding us back? You know, it, do every, does every local authority, not every local authority responded, does every local authority put this as one of their um, key priorities is to uh, teach first aid in school? I think, I think that's where this is going to uh, gain some ground, is to realise the potential within schools and to, to, to send the message, to get the backing of the Scottish Government from the Cabinet Secretary to send the message that 
it should really be part of the school curriculum and you know please look at it as part of your um, curriculum for excellence because without local authority buy-in we this is not going to go any further okay i couldn't agree more with uh, the, the comments by both my colleagues so um as with regard to further action uh, are we agreed that we want to write to to COSLA and teaching unions to seek its views on the action called for in the petition and also to ask SPICE to investigate international comparisons with regard to provision of first aid training in primary schools? If, if we are of a mind. Yes. Could, you know. Well, we are indeed, yes. <laughs> we, could, so. uh, we could also invite the Cabinet Secretary for Education for, to come in and, and, and give us his opinion on it. Okay. Um. <laughs> I think that's a really good idea because, um, as I said, I believe this can run in parallel with the out-of-hospital cardiac strategy as part of that to deliver really good outcomes, improve those outcomes even further. Okay. Um, it would do no harm to ask the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary to attend uh, a meeting at some point in the not-too-distant future um, in order to allow us to uh, show our uh, consensus with regard to support for this petition. And... Um, at that point, uh, I'd like to close the meeting and thank everyone for their contributions this morning. Thank you very much. <laughs>